us place here in Werribee is, um, is, is a place where we started and we put a completely edible garden in. And uh, as no doubt a lot of you are probably starting to do growing some of your own food, and if not, probably been growing it for a long time, particularly once you've got fruit trees, to get plenty of pollination on your fruit trees is, uh, means lots and lots of fruit. And that was important to me. Um, I'm only on a 500 square metre block and, uh, and it was important to try and get as much pollination as I possibly could. And, and what interested me most was that when I first started, I heard on the radio a mob called Rooftop Honey in the city. And what they were doing was they were populating the tops and rooftops of, of tall buildings in the city to, with bee, beehives. And, um, and uh, they were hosting hives here and there, which meant that um, for a bit of space, the owner of the building or the house that they were, and they were doing it in some of the suburbs um, would get, you know, for, for hosting the hive, a share in some of the honey, which sort of really got my ears pricked up. Anyway, I put my name down on the list and I pestered them for about probably six months to realise that Werribee was just too far from where their core business was and uh, that wasn't going to happen. So um, I, I put that down and, uh, and and went on with investigating how to become a beekeeper. And, um, I'll talk about um, how how and what is involved throughout this presentation. Uh, of course, um, we're talking about Apis mellifera, is the year introduced, introduced European honeybee, and um, we'll, we'll all know that, that you know this is the common honeybee that we have. It is not native, and it does sting. So, uh, um, and, and boy, does it does it hurt when you get stung. But I have to say. Uh, my fear was, was if you were poking around a hive, uh, you, you were absolutely going to get stung. There's no two ways about that. But generally, when they're out and about in the garden, it's very rare for someone to be stung. You actually have to be annoying the hell out of the bee for it to turn on you. And, um, you know, they're, they're a very busy little character and they, they're, they're very diligent about when they go, go about their work. You know, I've got um, lots and lots of plants in flower throughout the garden throughout the whole year so that I've always got something for them to feed on and um, you know when I get in their path or their way they move around me and they go back to where they were um, and they're, they're, they're very methodical about their work so it's not until you start and you know wave them about or, or, or brush them away do you start to uh, to get some undue attention from them so uh, best to just ignore them and, and they'll be fine with you. Um, you might be interested to know that bees account for about 80% uh, of all our food. Um, they pollinate about two, every, two, two out of every three handfuls that we feed ourselves comes from the result of pollination from bees. And um, you know, that, that's an amazing statistic. And uh, of course, when we came to Australia, we weren't very clever. We, we brought our food system with us. We don't eat a great deal that's native. Um, and, and, and of course, there are only a few of our native bees of the some 1300 different species we have in Australia actually like much of the food plants that we grow. Um, so it, we, we rely very heavily here on the European honeybee to pollinate what we eat. So, and, and according to Einstein, the bee, if it disappears from the earth, we've only got a few years uh, to live on the earth. And it's a bit unfortunate because bees are under threat and um, under threat from a number of different uh, sources, not the least of which the biggest threat of them all at the moment is a parasitic mite called the Varroa mite. And um, it, it rests on the back of the bee um, at, at pupil stage and, and it, it can collapse colonies, no problem at all. Um, and it's, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's a terrifying thought that we might get that one day. We are the only continent left on the planet that does not have the, the, the Varroa mite. It's in New Zealand, it's in Papua New Guinea. And in fact, we did have a ship pull up in our ports at Port Melbourne um, and they discovered a, uh, a fairly um, uh, small uh, swarm uh, that, that was near death, uh, but was heavily infested with varroa mite and uh, they exterminated it. And of course, luckily for us, um, CSIRO have sentinel hives at different um, ranges out from our, all of our ports with uh, sentinel hives and they, they actually check them. So I think they've got one at a series at 500 metres, a kilometre, 1.5 and so on, all the way out to five kilometres. And they systematically check those hives to ensure that we haven't somehow wound up with uh, with Varroa from our port. So 
good thing they uh, they found it early enough. Um, one of the things that we do need to be aware of, uh, and as I say, whilst we don't have the varroa mite, there are other things that are killing our bees. And one of them is colony collapse disorder. And that's brought about by us. Um, it's due to the things that we're using in our gardens, um, be it fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, um, even fertilizers. Um, you know, they, whilst they're out and they forage for about up to, you know, be somewhere between three and five kilometers from their hive, uh, they pick up minute particles of these uh, chemicals called neonicotinoids and they, they become lethal in lethal doses when they make honey with the pollen and the nectar that they're, they're using back at the hive. And, uh, of course, once the, the honey's been made and, and it gets to the right pressure, temperature and humidity, they, they cap it with wax. And it's not until the cold months when they rely heavily on this and they can't get out because of the weather or the rain, they uncap the wax and then they feed the colony from this honey. And unfortunately, there are lethal doses of these chemicals that we've been using that actually causes the colony collapse and, uh, and the hive dies. So uh, can I urge you just at this early point to try and use more natural methods like garlic sprays, chili sprays, or companion planting throughout your garden to deter some of the predatory pests, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the pest insects in your garden and attract in predators that will sort them out rather than resorting to sprays um, because we, we've really got to pay some attention to this and, and slow this colony collapse disorder down if we possibly can. Um, um, it's already happening in the, in, in the highlands of China the, the, because of the pollution and so forth and the chemicals that they've uh, used. They're having to teach uh, people to climb trees, even the young. Uh, as soon as they can climb trees and they're getting out with these great big long pollination sticks as you can see and if they don't get up there and pollinate the fruit trees they don't get any fruit so it's not if it's happening or if it's going to happen it's already happening so it really is um, you know it, it, it's it's on our doorstep unfortunately and we've really got to make some changes about um, about what we're doing and using in our garden so if you can find some alternatives and looks there are a lot of companies out there these days that are changing the way they're, they're delivering their sprays and what they're putting in them and making them pollinator friendly. Not just bees, but, but other types of beneficial insects that we rely on heavily to help pollinate our food. So there are other pests and diseases, unfortunately, and some of it involves reporting. Now, one of the, and, and I'll get to the reporting side of things um, a, bit, you know, a bit further into the presentation, but one of them is called uh, AFB, which is American fowl brood. Uh, we've talked about varroa mite. And, and look, I don't want to get bogged down in these pests and diseases because one, we don't have the varroa mite. Uh, AFB is about, but it's, 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 it's something that's not common, um, but needs monitoring. You've got to make sure that if you get it, you've got to alert the authorities that you've got it. And unfortunately, the lives need to be destroyed. Um, there is wax moth. And then there's greater wax moth and there's chalk brood and nosema, which is a fungal disease. And then there's small hive beetles. So they're not without their problems, but these other things can basically be sorted out with good management. But on the whole, provided, um, you know, you adhere to some of the guidelines in beekeeping, these things won't bother you too much. Um, so tonight really is about, is beekeeping to me? And I know, um, you know, with regard to the this movement of growing around food and um, seeing things like the, the, the flow hive, the one where you put the jar at the back of the hive and turn the key and, you know, it all looks great, but um, it, it's, I'm, I'm here to tell you that unfortunately it's not that simple. There are a few things that you need to abide by. Um, and there are some local bylaws that may or may, may, or may not stop you from, um, from having bees. Um, you, you do need to register with the Department of Agriculture or whatever the term they use these days is as a beekeeper, they are considered livestock and there are some guidelines and a code of ethics that you must abide by. Um, and, and that's very important. You know, for instance, you've got to have uh, fences that are greater than 2.1 metres high where you're going to keep your hive. That basically gets the bees out of, out of your bee line. And that's funny how um, some of the sayings that we use actually depict what's going on. So if I was to plonk a beehive right up the backyard against the fence, facing out into the, the, you know, into the backyard towards me, 
I'm going to be in their bee line. And if you've got a colony of maybe 20 or 30,000 bees, which is generally about the size of a hive, even a small hive, really about 20,000 bees, um, at some point you're going to be in their bee line. They take the, uh, the most direct route to the place that we're, that, where they're headed. And uh, so the idea of having a greater than 2.1 metres high fence will get the beehive, the bees and their flight path well above you. And basically what you do is you face the beehive toward the fence with a distance between the fence and the front of the hive. And that way they've, they've got no chance but to, to, to fly back down and fly back up to, to, to enter and leave. Um, you need to work out whether you're allergic or not. Some people have never been stung or, or, or and some have. Um, and that's important too, because you may have an anaphylactic reaction to a bee sting. So how do I test? So you can get a pollen test done at your local chemist and uh, ask them that you're considering, let the, let the chemist know that you're considering being a beekeeper, but you've never been stung and you're not sure, can you give me a pollen test? And they'll be able to abide, uh, oblige, I'm sure. Um, is your property uh, or site adequate? Now, we've just explained the, the, the 2.1 uh, metre height, but there are some, um, some square meterage rules. Um, you can't have a beehive on anything less than 500 square metres. So if your property is less than that, then I'm afraid it's, the beekeeping is not going to be for you. You must have at least 500 square metres. Um, and you can have up to two hives on that property um, and once you get out to an acre, you're able to have pretty well watch a lot to a, to a degree. Um, of course, you're going to need to you know, work out whether you are you using things that are likely to be a problem for the bees, including fungicides and insecticides, as uh, previously discussed. Um, what type of hives should I have? There are quite a few, and as you can see, Langstroth um, is is probably the most common, and it's the second one from the left. Um, the top bar hive is the one on the far right. Um, that actually has no frames in it as such, just pieces of timber and some wax underneath. And the comb is the, the honeycomb gets built underneath. The actual underneath of the, the hive is open. Um, the flow hive is the one with the dainty little roof and the window in the sides. That's the one I was explaining how you put a turnkey at the uh, the back and, and and what happens is that the plastic hive inserts split and the honey runs down to the bottom. So there's no, you don't actually have to retrieve the honey from the, um, the, the frames themselves. And there's the war hive, um, which is another one altogether, not probably as common as uh, any of the others. So, uh, and, and a lot will come down to, um, you know, in terms of uh, your budget, because beekeeping's not as cheap as perhaps people think, you know, to start off with a, a flow hive, you're looking at somewhere between eight hundred to a thousand dollars to set to set up properly uh, for something like a top bar hive, probably three or four hundred dollars. Um, same with the um, a Langstroth, which is the most common. Um, so you know your, your budget may be a, a bit of a constraint as well. So um, yeah, you, you're going to have to do a little bit of research with regard. What sort of equipment you're going to need? Well, certainly a smoker. Um, you, you're going to need a bee brush. A bee brush is uh, horse hair and very, very soft. And sometimes we need to brush the bees off some of the frames that we, uh, we take out of the hive to inspect them. Um, you're going to need some hive tools, which are those um, uh, red handled uh, gadgets, one with a hook on the end and one with a, with a uh, chisel like end. They're actually to prise the, uh, the frames apart because when the bees uh, start and build wax out on the foundation, um, the, the wax foundations we put on these frames that go into a hive and they build them out, we call that drawing comb out. Um, sometimes they'll join it from one frame to another and, uh, and stick it down with a thing called propolis. And propolis is all the saps and resins that they bring back from the trees. And uh, it's like, it's like a, a really hard set glue. And sometimes you even need to uh, smack the hive tool with, with the other hive tool to chisel through it to, to break it open. It's that strong. Um, you might need a comb rake, which is that, uh, that wide uh, comb-like uh, tool there. Um, you might need a frame cramp to, to uh, lift the frame out easily with just one hand. Um, you might need a hot knife, which is the one next to the brush. 
Well, we just immerse that in some boiling water and that helps cut the comb off the frames to get to the honey. So there are some bits and pieces that you're going to need to, uh, to, uh, to ensure that what you're going to do is made fairly easy. I recommend highly that you get the right tools. Don't try and improvise with these sorts of things because my experience is that it's made much more difficult without the right tools. By the way, you cannot open a beehive on a total fire ban day. Because you've got to use smoke or a smoker, um, it's banned. It's, it's illegal to open a, a hive for fear that uh, when you give that a bit of a puff, you might spark send sparks or embers out of the um, out of the, the, the smoker. And by the way, I tend to use either pine needles um, or I, I have a lavender hedge here. And I actually, when I clip that, I, I let that dry and I use lavender in it. I tend not to use paper or anything that might be a bit toxic to the bees. So, um, yeah, just give that some consideration when you uh, when you come to use uh, a smoker if you're going to go down that path. Of course, the wonderful thing about having bees is that you get honey. And these are those frames that I'm talking about that the um, this is a fully capped uh, frame. And as you can see through the different times of the year, the honey is darker and lighter. You can see it underneath the capped uh, frame. And um, to be honest, let me see if I can zoom in here. I can. Um, not quite all completely filled uh, capped, but the majority. So I don't harvest frames until they're pretty well, you know, 90% capped. If you take frames out that are, you know, even 50% capped, you'll find that the honey will uh, evaporate through, the water will evaporate out of the honey very quickly and, uh, and it will crystallise extremely fast. So... Um, and that comes from it not being, you know, allowed to get to the right humidity, temperature, and pressure. They, they, they're very, very diligent. These bees, they, they, they keep it at the correct temperature, about thirty-eight point five degrees inside a hive. And on hot days, they even cart water back to the entrance and will fan it like an evaporative cooler. They're quite incredible once you start to understand how they work and what they get up to. Of course, you're going to need some way of being able to get the honey out of the frames. Um, I don't cut comb out of my frames. And in fact, there is wires that go through the center of those frames that is strained. And then there's a, a wax single, uh, quite thin um, beeswax foundation sheet melted onto the wax. And um, what we do is you can see these two little, um, uh, little tacks there on the, on the top end of the frame. Um, we actually clip on a, 20, a 12 volt battery charger, one on one side and the positive on one side and the negative on the other side. And it's continuous wire and that heats up and uh, we just simply take it off once, the, once the, uh, the foundation wax is melted onto the wires. So it's that simple. Um, so using the hot uh, knife, either electric hot knife or, or even the comb rake sometimes is okay. You just simply run the rake over the top of the comb and that exposes the honey, and then you put it into a honey spinner. Now these can you can you can hire these from some uh, places, um, but if you've got if you're going to do this for a long term, I'd suggest you go and buy one. Um, they're all food food grade um, stainless steel, um, and they're a centrifugal spinner that uh, is geared on the top. Uh, this one is a three frame uh, spinner. Uh, no, four does four frames at a time. Um, and you spin it and it centrifugally spins the honey um, out onto the sides of the uh, of the uh, the barrel and it, and it drips down, of course, and collects in the bottom. And then we put it through a two-stage cold filter. That just filters out any stray body parts, legs or wings that you might get in or a little bit of wax. Um, you don't very often get much body parts. Uh, they're very, very clean bees. They take out any debris. Um, the death of a bee, they'll take that outside. And so they do housekeeping every day. Um, so yeah, it's fairly rare to have that sort of stuff come up in the, uh, in the filter, but certainly some wax particles will. Um, so, and that's as much as, uh, as we do. It's pure, raw, unadulterated, not heated, um, just simply sent through the two stage strainer. Um, you can also buy strainers. Um, one fits over the top of another. Um, and they're quite fine, the, particularly the first one. Oh, sorry, the, the second one. So, um, 
of course, you're going to need to be suited up and some gloves, um, most important. And you can get some really cheap suits out there, but my experience is um, you can still get stung through cheap suits. Um, and you, you want to choose carefully. So make sure you go to a place that will allow you to try them on so that you're comfortable. And bear in mind on a hot day, these things, because they're quite thick, can be very, very warm. And bear in mind that the majority of your work is going to have to be done throughout the warmer months. It's the winter months that we don't really do a great deal with, with bees. So on, you know, from, from spring onwards, we call spring the swarming season, which is what happens so over winter. The, the, uh, the, uh, at the end of the start of spring, they, the, the queen lays um, some, uh, some eggs and uh, queen, some new queen eggs. And, uh, and they get fed royal jelly and about 16 days later, up she, they hatch and, and, and they go and mate with, with uh, drones and half the hive swarms. So sometimes the old queen goes with half of the hive and sometimes the new queen does. Just, it just depends. There's no rhyme or reason as to which way it goes. But, um, uh, but back to the, to the, uh, to the suit. Um, some suits have really good ventilation. They've got mesh front and back and um, I, I, I wished I had known that initially when I first went and bought my first suit because I used to nearly pass out. It used to be so hot. Uh, nowadays, I've got a wonderful suit that's completely ventilated. It's like air conditioning in it. So, And it's important to have a frame that actually keeps the mesh off your face um, because sometimes bees can get a little bit angry. If you're breaking into their house and, uh, and stirring up um, what, what is normally quite placid and taking some of their food, you can imagine that sometimes they can get a little bit angry. So um, if they land on, on some mesh and it's stuck to your face, there's a good chance you'll get stung through the mesh. So whatever type of helmet you have, um, or, or headgear, I should say, uh, or veil, uh, is suspended away from your face and kept that way. These have got um, hardened plastic frames that slip inside the um inside the uh the face shield uh, or the hat, the, the hat and uh, and it, it keeps it well away from your face um it's one thing again to um to think about having bees but it's another thing to actually uh pull a frame out that looks like this with you know a couple of thousand bees on it and um it could, it's pretty daunting the first time you do it let me tell you um but when you and, and look, I highly recommend that you, um, you know, if, if you're going to go down this path, think about all the things that I've spoken about tonight. And maybe get yourself off to a bee club and, and, and before you, you know, go and invest a lot of money and a lot of time, um, perhaps go to someone's place that's already got bees and, 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 and try it out for yourself. Because as I say, it's, it's one thing to be romanced into the fact that I'm going to have a beehive and, and have my own bees and, and make my own honey, but it's another to actually do it. And um, it's a, it's an awesome thing once you once you get over the fear or the or the um, you know the hesitation. And uh, generally moving slow. Um, when you open up a hive, I often say, if I practice what I preach, I'd never get stung. Um, and I have open days at my place every so often, and I have a lot of people. I do a lot of workshops or have done over the past. No one but no one but from me ever get stung. And that's generally because I don't take my own advice. So the, 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 the things not to do are don't go there first thing in the morning. You know, the bees don't start and get out until it starts to warm up. So when you lift the lid off their house and you've got a colony of 40 or 50,000 bees there and you've taken the lid off and you've let the cold air in and you've got 50,000 beady little eyes looking up at you saying, really, do you want some of this? Um, it's not a good idea, let me tell you. If you want to tick them off, that's that's an easy way to do it. Um, and of course, me being me, um, I don't have time. I'll I'll get down there. I'll, they'll be right. And of course, inherently, something goes wrong and I get stung. Um, always have your safety gear on. Always make sure you let them know you're coming. Uh, better to come through the middle of the day when half of the bees are out foraging. That's a good idea. Instead of getting it out there in the first thing in the morning when they're all home, um, you know that that lessens the amount of disruption that you're giving your bees. Um, 
and make sure that you give it a puff of smoke around the vent holes at the top and a little bit of puff of smoke at the bottom. Let them know you're coming. That'll help slow them, pacify them down a little bit. Um, it's most important, you know, and move slowly. You know, take your time. Don't be, don't, don't be in a rush, unlike me from time to time. Um, it's your fire way of ticking them off. Don't do it on a windy day. They don't like wind. And they, if, they're, if they're out foraging and working hard in the wind, the last thing they want to do is find you, you back at their, their hive rating what they're working hard to, to produce, you know. So, you know, consider these things before you start um, opening up a hive. By the way, in the um, from spring onwards, and really it's the couple of weeks before uh, the end of winter, I start opening the hive to see how they're going. And quite often you'll be surprised, particularly if there's lots of food and forage about, and particularly if you're in the suburbs um, and you guys out where you are, no doubt you'll have plenty of food uh, for them to forage on. And if it's been reasonably plentiful, plentiful from winter, you'll find that there'll be more than likely some queen cells um, in your hive. And I'll point one at what they look like out very shortly. Um, um, just bear with me for a tick. Um, when they swarm um, and they leave the hive, like I said, one either the new queen or the old queen flies with, you know, half of the hive. She's mated with... Uh, a couple of drones and she's now uh, ready to go and because uh, the two queens can't coexist uh, they have to go so um, these are generally when they're about their safest because they're not looking after any young or brood or, or or the queens protected in amongst all of these and, and they, they don't land very far away from from their hive um, and they, they land in some quite awkward positions sometimes they'll be off the side of the dog kennel or the side of the bin or a, or a, a meter box or a, a letter box or I've, I've found them in all sorts of places um, on kids swings fence posts you name it round eaves uh, amazing where they where you find them but they're just simply there while the scout bees are out trying to find an appropriate place to call home now in the it, when you become a beekeeper this is something that you are discouraged from doing allowing the hive to swarm and um, they don't want you to do that they don't want you to allow you know 20 or 30,000 bees leave your hive and fly around the suburbs which you can understand so it's in the code of ethics you've got to make sure that you do whatever you can to either stop the queen from laying queen cells and if she does you, you're supposed to find them and kill them off so that they don't swarm or split the hives and make one hive into two and stop them that way so um, but anyway, look, this tonight isn't really about how to beekeep. It's about whether it's a good fit for you and what is involved in getting on board and, and the ways and things that you've got to consider. Um, so obviously getting the position right is very, very important, um, mainly because there's an old saying with beekeeping that you can shift the hive two yards or two miles, but nothing in between. So in the old, in the, in the old scale. Um, the reason they say that is that bees recognise their flight path by landmarks and they find their way back to the hive by lo those landmarks. Um, so if you were to shift that hive whilst bees were out during the day, three metres away from where, where it was, you probably just about killed that, that colony because they won't find their way back to that hive. Sounds ridiculous to us, but I can assure you it's correct. So making sure where you put that hive is in the right spot. So generally northeast uh, facing is best so that you haven't got the hot, uh, you know, afternoon sun on it. It only gets the morning sun um, and preferably a little bit of shade in the hot afternoon so that they're not, you know, out in full sun. But sometimes beggars can't be choosers. If you haven't got any cover, well, you haven't got any cover. But I can assure you it's the best you can. You've got to consider their flight path. Like I said, you know, they, they make a bee, bee line. Are you going to be in that? What can you do to disrupt that? You know, sometimes you might have to build a wall or a trellis and grow a climber up over the front of it instead of facing it toward a back fence if you haven't got a back fence. It might be a shed that you might be able to use, you know, to sort of get them up and, and, and do that spiral flight up out of your, your flight path. You want them out, outside of your head height. 
um, bearing in mind that they need plenty of, of um, food and forage. So, you know, if you're out on a farm that, that does nothing but grass hay, you might, and, and little garden, that, that, that hive will struggle, you know, and particularly if the surrounding problems, the surrounding properties are similar. Uh, whereas if you're in the, the, the urban, the, 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 um, the suburbs, you know, you've got plenty of build up um, homes and the like around you, you're going to have plenty for them. That's, that's fine. Um, is, fresh water is another thing that needs to be close by and near, not, not the dog's bowl or a kid's swimming pool or, you know, um, you'd be surprised. They drink up to a litre of water a hive. Um, so it, it does need to make sure that, you know, you've got, um, you've got plenty of water about. Sometimes I, I, I put in a, a little frog bog with some aquatic plants on the top of it. Uh, which, which I'm pretty sure I've got a photo of uh, to show you. Um, how to get bees. So you've decided that you, it's a fit for you. You've got the right position. You've got uh, the 2.1 metre high fences. You're registered. So what do you, how do you get bees? Well, sometimes people um, in the beekeeping clubs, and, and, and I, I encourage you to get on board with a beekeeping club. There are plenty of them about or join um, some of them on Facebook, there are plenty of those about for beekeeping. Um, they'll, they'll point you straight. They're, they're a good mob. They're, um, they're all a common cause. They, they all love bees and, and will help wherever they possibly can. So someone might catch a swarm and um, you simply uh, tip them out, just like you're seeing in there. When I saw this happen, I was horrified. And they actually shook the, the last of the bees out of the... Um, just excuse me for a minute while I've got the dog. Um, sorry about that. So they, they literally shake the bees out of the container onto the top of the, the, uh, the frames and the bees make their way down uh, in, well into the hive. So, okay. Um, so the makeup of a hive, uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Um, you've got the stand, which is at the base, and then you have a bottom board. Uh, some bottom boards will have uh, a frame that uh, will allow you to um, uh, put a, a, a small hive beetle frame that the, the hive beetle can't come through. Uh, and then you've got what we call a super or uh, the first box where you put in the, your, um, your frames. Now, Langstroth uh, hives will either have eight or 10 uh, frames. They're all the same size, the frames, just the amount that they hold. And let me tell you, full of honey, they can be quite weighty. Um, each box can sometimes weigh, you know, 20 kilos. Um, so you, you start and put, you know, three, four or five boxes on top of these things and they can be a considerable weight. Um, then you put a queen excluder in. Well, that's the, the, the first bottom of two boxes, really uh, what we call brood boxes, where the queen um, stays and lays her eggs and, uh, and feed the young and so forth. That's where a lot of the work goes on. And then we put in a queen excluder, which stops the queen from getting up into the boxes above where we're going to put the honey supers in. And we call them supers. It's a nickname for them. Um, can be either the small uh, frames, which we call ideals, or same size as the deep hive bodies uh, below. So that goes on top of the queen excluder. Now, queens are about twice the size um, of a normal honeybee, and she can't fit through the grill um, that, that is the queen excluder. And we don't want her to be up there laying eggs in what we're going to use for honey for obvious reasons. And then you have a uh, cover over the top of those so that they can't get in there and, and lay uh, wax or comb up in the lid. And then of course the lid goes on the top and it's vented so that uh, the whole thing breathes. So, and of course, depending upon the type of um, hive you'll get, there are some different configurations but it won't be until you um, become a little bit more familiar with what sort of hive will best suit you. Um, and you're gonna to need to do a bit more investigation into some of those things, whether it be a flow hive. Flow hives, there's some great advantages with flow hives. You don't need a, a honey spinner. Uh, you don't need to worry about cutting wax comb off. Um, you still need to do all the other things. So you need to register and you need to stop the swarms and you, know, you need to regularly check and, and so on. So there are all those things you still have to do. It's just when it comes to harvest honey, it's made a little easier. 
Um, I don't have a flow hive, so I'm, I'm not not the right person to give you any good advice about a flow hive. But Langstroth is certainly my specialty. I've not had any experience with the Warra hive or the um, or the other um, top bar. Um, top bar hives generally they they harvest the comb and the the honey. Let me tell you a little bit about um, about um, comb um, it's a very valuable commodity to the bees it takes them about five grams of um, of what they forage to make one gram of wax where it only takes one gram of pollen and nectar to make one gram of honey so cutting wax out on the bees makes the bees work much harder than I believe they should have to so I'd much rather just simply uh, take the uh, the capping off the the, the the frames which does limited amount of damage they, they repair it very quickly and they're back into filling it back up with honey again rather than if I cut the whole comb out and take the comb away, then they've got to rebuild all the comb first before they can come back to fill it up with, with, uh, with honey. So that's why I sort of reckon that that's the way to go. Um, so what does a... Uh, what do the bees look like? So the small one on the left is, of course, a worker bee or female. The middle one is the drone, which is the males. And the males, um, apart from keeping the, the queen fertilised, don't do very much. In fact, they probably live in the lap of luxury until about winter time when, if uh, the pickings are slim, they get killed off and thrown out of the hive. Uh, and then there's the queen bee. Now, I don't mark my queens, but um, some of the, uh, the bigger, um, more productive uh, organisations do. I'm not one of those. Um, it does, I must say, uh, make it easier for you to spot them. But as you can see, they're about twice the length, uh, much, much bigger bee than um, than the uh, the worker bee and uh, quite long, as a matter of fact. Uh, the small, they're about 22 to 25 millimetres long, whereas the, uh, the worker bee is only about 12 to 14 or thereabouts. Uh, like I alluded to before, that they certainly are thirsty little critters. Um, they can drink up to about a litre of water per day. If you're near a water course, please don't use this. This is called a Zola. But if you're not near a water course, it's a great, easy, simple plant to grow. Um, if you are near a water course, choose up something like water lettuce, um, lilies, water lilies. They're, they're fantastic. Uh, look, stones if you have to, but stones still heat up, unfortunately. They cause a lot of evaporation. So if you're not there feeding, uh, filling back up the water, that you're putting out and, and they're often um, pot containers that are filled up with small pebbles and then people fill them up with water. So the bees have got something to land on. Um, but, but I still find that they still drown in those too. So whereas these um, are cool on their feet, they're able to you know land on them quite easily without fear of drowning. Um, they, they're able to stick their proboscis down through the, the fronds on the, the plants or from the side of the plants Sometimes they'll actually take a whole droplet of water away, as I say, and then fan that at the front of the hive to uh, evaporatively cool the hive, which is uh, a sight to see, I can assure you. Um, so how do I track bees into my garden? Well, mauve and blue flowering plants generally do it best. So um, as you can see, here's that lavender hedge that I was talking about at my front uh, entrance. And in fact, as I look at the uh, my office door at the moment, it's a uh, window. It's absolutely full of, uh, of flowers and bees still coming and going. Um, the blue flower in the middle is borage. It's a wonderful old fashioned um, herb. Tastes, it's an edible herb, leaves and flowers. Only the small uh, leaves, I must admit. Uh, tastes a little bit like cucumber, but the bees absolutely love it. But things like echiums and salvias um, are, are wonderful. So mauve and blue flowering, Plants are uh, exceptionally good at uh, attracting in bees, um, as well as things like um, small rockery plants. Nemesia would be another fantastic choice that, uh, that I would get in. Um, blue flowering lobelias, sunflowers are another great way of, um, of being able to, uh, to attract them in. And of course, here's some others that uh, will go well. Um, marigold, lemon balm, they call that the bee bush. And in fact, um, I learned early in the piece if by chance you happen to get a swarm and you try to attract it into a, uh, a blank box with some, um, some fresh uh, frames with foundation on them, 
rub uh, lemon balm leaves on the inside of it, and that actually mirrors the smell of um, of the pheromones that a queen bee puts out, and it's more likely to lure the scout bees in uh, into the hive and call that home. So um, I mentioned uh, echium, but calendula is another one. Sage we talked about oregano, alyssum, thyme. They're all wonderful, great plants to have um, in a, in a mix in amongst your garden. Um, even in pots is okay, um, provided you've got plenty of it. And, and over the, the course of your 12 months, try and ensure that you've got stuff that, um, you know, that they're going to uh, easily be able to use and get to. Uh, as you can see, did you know that a 450 gram jar of honey requires 1,152 bees to travel 180,246 kilometres and visit 4.5 million flowers? That's 156 kilometres per bee they fly to um, to make just a 400 gram, uh, 450 gram jar of honey. It's quite an unbelievable statistic, but um, as I say, they work very, very hard and they're tireless. Uh, they, they never, ever stop, uh, re regardless of rain, hail or, or shine. The rain does slow them down, I've got to say, but even on the colder days, once it's up above about seven or eight degrees, they're out. And, uh, and they stay out until they can't uh, stay out any longer. So um, quite incredible. Um, it's remarkable when you watch them at the hive. Okay, so looks like I've got a bit of a, oh no, we're right. Thank God I thought we were gonna stuck there for a minute. Um, this is a couple of shots of my hive at different stages. Uh, of uh, of the year. As you can see, I've got two brood uh, boxes and two honey boxes on the top of this one. Now you can see all those bees on this one. We call this bearding. And this can happen for a couple of reasons. Um, it can be very hot. And I'd say this was hot at that particular point um, that I took this. Um, yeah, so, and or overcrowded. So that can happen for quite a couple of uh, those couple of reasons, and um, and of course here's an active uh, hive bees coming and going. And as you can see, we've got a grapevine grown in front of uh, the entrance of this hive, and that gets the bees up, um, up and above and out of my uh, my head height. And of course, my my fences are actually greater than two point one meters high. They have to be, it, it can't be 2.1, it has to be greater than 2.1. 2.2 um, <laughs>2 metres 101 is okay, 2 metres 100 is not. Uh, I know this because I had someone complain and um, my fences were just a couple of millimetres under 2.1 2, 2 metres. So I had to extend the height of the fence by a few millimetres to, to comply. So, um, I say that so that you're aware. This is what a um, queen cell looks like. So those sort of long, uh, vertical, um, ugly looking appendages at the bottom of this comb are queen cells. Now, what happens is that the queen, when she decides to, um, that it's time at the end of the, the winter months to um, appropriate, she orders some queen cells to be made and they're made generally the, the test ones are made up at the top of the frames um, just to sort of, she gets them to make those to sort of test how they, how good they are. And once they get them right, then they start and lay them at the very bottom of the frames. She lays eggs in those. And because they're in vertical cells, the worker bees know to feed those particular uh, eggs um, royal jelly. And that's what turns those eggs into um, royalty. That's why they call it royal jelly. They become queens. And about 16 days later, they hatch, emerge, and fly the uh, the hive and mate with one or two or several uh, drones. Uh, once the drones are mated, they die. That's the end of them. And she flies back, and then um, there's uh, obviously some, some communication as to which one is going and which one's staying. And uh, in a fairly short space of time, within minutes, <coughs> they uh, they swarm and uh, you'll know when they swarm let me tell you because the whole sky fills up with thousands of bees and you can't it's like uh it's like an airplane going off it's incredible 
So if you think you're going to be a beekeeper, the next steps really are to download the Code of Ethics from the Department of Agriculture in Victoria and just simply type in <coughs> beekeeping registration in Google. Excuse me, thirsty work. I highly recommend that you join a beekeeping club. Try and find a mentor within that. Also check your local bylaws and reg uh, regulations. And start and prepare if everything is looking honky-dory, start and prepare your property for an apiary, i.e. checking bee line and, you know, get a concrete pad down where you're going to sit your hive. <coughs> um, give some consideration to making sure that you're going to get that bee freeway well and truly out of your head height. Um, particularly if you've got kids, you know, it's most important you, you do whatever you can to, to keep them up out of the air. You won't even know you've got bees if you don't, if you, if you, uh, if you uh, don't put anything in front of that hive, I can assure you, you'll have nothing but trouble. So, um, and then of course, you must register as a beekeeper with the Department of Agriculture, the same place you'll download the Code of Ethics. Now, there's some reasons why you've got to do that because there are some reporting that needs to go on. So if you happen to have, and you've got to do some tests that need to be reported on. So for AFB or American Fowl Brood, uh, there's a check and a test, and, and, and this is all in the Code of Ethics on how to do this. Um, and if you happen to find that you've got it, you've got to alert them straight away. Likewise with the varroa mite check. The others you don't need to worry so much, but it is uh, vitally important that that uh, it's reported. Because it's such a large industry and it's so vital for our food system, it's extremely important that that we're on top of it. So um, there, there is some obligation that you, uh, you go down the path of. And if by chance you decide that it's not for you, then there are always ways of being able to attract in just as many bees as you would have if you had bee hotels. Not all my bees stay home. Uh, they travel quite a long distance, as I say, between three and five kilometres from the hive, whilst I've got heaps and heaps and heaps for them to feed from. But because, like us, we need diversity in our lives and they get all sorts of things from all sorts of different plants, not the least of which things like propolis, and pollen and different sorts of nectar and so on. So, you know, they'll, they will travel. So, uh, so what you need to do is just start and plant out your garden with things that are going to attract in, you know, some pollinating insects, not the least of which the honeybee. And of course, um, get some of these up, make them yourself or, or purchase them. You can, they're, they're, they're quite easy. These will house some of the small, you won't get um, European honeybees take, take, uh, take up residence in any of these, but Things like the Victorian blue banded bee, probably not so much in this, but certainly some of the other native small um, wasps and the like that uh, are great pollinators, uh, hoverflies, and, and and all sorts of other uh, insects that will help you out in the garden. So, and if you can make them resident, you've got half a chance to, uh, you know, to do fairly well. Um, in terms of the native um, bee, this is the Victorian blue banded bee. Um, if you've got apples. And uh, or tomatoes, and particularly tomatoes. You can see this is a shot of uh, one that's in my backyard. Um, I get them each year. It's still a bit cool for them just yet, but they're buzz pollinators. They're um, they're a bit like the bumblebee. They're a different pollinator than a um, than a European honeybee. Um, they actually shake the pollen free from the flower, and of course they're quite a hairy little insect. And, uh, and they go from flower to flower, and particularly on tomatoes, if you can get them on tomatoes, because honeybees don't like tomatoes. So it's these guys, or you, you're basically left to the wind or, or self-pollination. So, um, but on apple flowers, they love those. So uh, good, good thing to do if you can get them, get them in. So, oh, excuse me while I get that right. Uh, hoverflies, uh, another great little pollinator. Things like... Um, seaside daisies and the like will attract these guys in. Um, you know, there's there's a whole range of, of wonderful little insects that will, uh, will absolutely help you out. So, um, and don't forget to plant lots and lots of other types of flowers as well. It doesn't just necessarily need to be mauve or blue flowering. It's about getting plenty of diversity in your gardens to help them with all the other bits and pieces that they need. Um, you'd be surprised at the sorts of nectars and so forth 
This uh, one on the left-hand side is a snake, snake wine creeper, um, not edible. Uh, does produce um, a bean that looks edible, but it, it's absolutely not. Um, and, and highly perfumed and, and a lovely plant, but the bees absolutely love it. So, um, yeah, most important. Um, of course, if you've got fruit trees, and that's the sole reason why I decided to go down the path of looking into becoming a beekeeper. And it was really to increase the pollination of my fruit trees so that I got a good amount of fruit. Um, but what I come to realise uh, was that in reality, I probably wasn't going to get any better pollination than I, I was going to get without bees anyway because of the, the need and necessity um, for, for the rest to travel much further from the hive to go out and source the food that they want. Um, you know, there would have only been a small amount of bees that come along and, and in comparison to the, 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 the amount that are in the hive uh, to do the pollination necessary on the fruit trees that I have. And I must admit, I've got quite a lot of fruit trees in my, uh, my yard. I suppose the, the, the travel and circumnavigate the fence all the way around. So, um, and quite a lot of them are multi-grafted. So uh, it was my, my, my goal to make sure that I got them uh, well and truly pollinated. But as I say, you don't necessarily need to have a beehive to, uh, to do that. Well, um, hopefully you've enjoyed that. This is uh, my website, craigcastry.com.au. I'm the author of these four books, uh, Edible Garden Secrets, out this week. Um, I've only got a few uh, limited. I've nearly sold out of these. I've got another print run going at the moment, but I won't get them until about the 7th of December. So if you'd like a copy of any of these books, by all means, please get along to my website. The, um, the, the three on the right-hand side, Edible Gardens, uh, a practical guide, the one in the middle, Edible Gardening Secrets, the new one, and Plant Profiles are all about horticulture and uh, um, edible gardening, obviously. And the other one is a uh, um, about self-sufficiency. It's got about 40 different recipes on um, how to make all sorts of things, including sourdough bread. There's about 12 or 14 different cheeses in there, not the least of which Stilton and feta and camembert and ricotta and all sorts. Uh, halloumi, um, how to make your own charcuterie, bacon, prosciutto, salami, uh, how to make passata, and that look, there's a whole range. And there's on the website there is a table of contents list on all of the uh, the books, so you can see what's involved in it. So um, with that, I'll um, I'll stop sharing and come back to the the broadcast, and um, we'll see if we can't answer some questions. Okay, so how do we go? We got any questions that I can um, that I can answer? I can't hear anyone, so I hope you can hear me. Craig, I'm just having a look through the chat to see if we've got some questions there. I'm not sure if you've been keeping an eye on that. Oh, uh, no, not really. I, I couldn't see it through the presentation. So. Um, I'll just read out a couple of bits to you. Thanks. Uh, Francis says, hi, Craig, I've been stung quite a bit. One hive is more aggro than other oh, hives. Okay, yep. Okay, so the tone of the queen sets the tone of the hive. Unfortunately, you may need to requeen that hive. You need to chase her down, kill her off, and get a uh, well. You need to get a new queen first. Um, uh, gold fields. Um, John Edmonds, Edmonds Honey in Torquay. I think he may post them in the mail for you. Um, so look him up online. Um, that that would be the best way. So as I say, the tone of the tone of the hive is set by the tone of the queen and sometimes queens can grow angry unfortunately and once that happens the whole hive turns angry and uh, they're difficult to deal with so that's the only way forward to um, get a passive queen generally the Italian queens and John has a queen called um, Carniolan bees and they're one of the most they're small but they're a, a wonderfully productive and very passive bee 
and uh, they're remarkably quiet, and um, that's probably what you need. So I How hope do that I spell helps. it, Craig? Sorry? How do I spell that? Uh, Carney Olin uh, or jo John Edmonds? I know John, the, the name of the bee. Oh, Carney Olin. C-A-R-N-O-L-I-A-N, -I, um, I believe. So it's one thing saying you need to read Queen. When you try to read Queen, it's so hard to find the Queen you need. To Absolutely it is. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's not hard. That's why sometimes the uh, a marked Queen is a great thing to have because they're a bit easier to find. Look, you need to work from the outside in, use plenty of smoke uh, and, and work reasonably quickly because she will. And, and basically what you need to do is to um, shake the bees off um, over the top of the hive, brush them off and then set that frame aside and continue to do that working from both outside towards the, 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 the inner uh, and you'll eventually track her down. Is she most likely uh, to be on the bottom, on the floor? Uh, no, no, no. She'll, she'll travel... She'll travel away from the sun. So that's why I say you've got to work quickly. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's unfortunate, but it's, yeah, it, it's about the only way forward, unfortunately. I had someone try and work with me on it, and he was experienced, but he couldn't find her. So yeah, okay. end, I did have a queen, a new yeah. queen, but we just couldn't find her. So I put the queen in, an, the new queen in another hive. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a shame. Um, yes. Look, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not, you know. So um, I wish I had easier news to, to give you, but I can't. I'm sorry. Craig, we have another question here, which yep. was from Dale Cousins. I'm not sure if Dale's still on. I think he might have had to go. When is the best time of day to check your hives? Oh, middle of the day, you know, in the warmest part of the day, really, is when, when they're out, the most of it, when the, when the majority of them are out. It's, you know, late in the afternoon or early in the morning, it's not the time. They're all home. So. And we've got lots of very nice comments about the information that you've provided in your talk. Um, oh, that's right. So I've, I've got a question for you. Um, yep. what, what do you do with all the honey? I know um, you might sell some of it. Do you use much of it yourself? Oh, absolutely. We don't use sugar in the house. We use only honey. And is, so is it baking tastes good? Oh, absolutely. There's nothing better <laughs> than your own honey, I can assure you. And I guess I guess to some degree, um, you get to choose how it's flavoured to some degree. I mean, we, uh, because of the, the types of forage that they're getting, um, I've got a, a fair bit of citrus that when it's in flower, you can sometimes smell and taste the, the citrus tones in the in the honey. Um, I sometimes get hints of lavender because of the amount of lavender. Sometimes we'll get hints of rosemary in it, you know. So it's it's very floral, the, the honey. It's not, um, you know, people ask me, oh, what flavour is it? Well, it's not red gum or it's not because, you know, for it to be a particular variety of varietal honey needs to be in quite a large forest of that particular variety, you know, whereas when in the urban, in the urban sprawl, um, when they're out and foraging from all sorts of bits and pieces, particularly in a garden like mine that's got lots of edibles, herbs and uh, and wonderful scents, that, that gets mirrored in the honey, you know. So, yeah, we, we just call it floral honey. But it does change. Um, over the colder months, it tends to be darker. And in the warmer months, you know, in the summer, we start to harvest. Um, and, and look, you know, you, you generally get about three harvests at least two harvests a year and sometimes three, depending upon how good the season is. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens this year, particularly with uh, the La Nina being predicted with a, a much cooler, wetter summer, whether the, the forage is, uh, is better or worse. And there might be less days that they can get out, so maybe we might, get a, might not get as much honey this year as we think. So, yeah, look, and I sell it at the front door. Um, and of course, my friends and uh, and family are always in honey. So, yeah, you you will harvest a fair bit. So, as I say, if you've got a couple of boxes, you're at least going to get twenty, maybe forty kilos twice a year. So, you want to give some consideration of what you, what you're going to do with that. <laughs> so, it's a lot of honey, isn't it? But it's uh, it is. It is. Stuff. 
and it doesn't yeah. go out of date. That's correct. Isn't no, it? no, that's the other thing, you know. So provided you you make sure that you're harvesting from only capped frames, um, and you want to try and get them, as I say, about 90 to 95 percent fully capped, um, it won't evaporate, so it will last. They find they find they, they found honeycomb that date back to the the, the Egyptian eras that are still as good as the day it was it was capped. So it doesn't go off. It's one of the 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 the, the, the few things that we know that um, that are natural that don't go off. So quite incredible. Yeah. Um, <coughs> do we have any questions from anybody else? And yeah, and if I'd we do, like, I'd like to ask. Craig, it's Christine. Good eye, how are you going? Good. Um, I've got a top bar which I'm setting up and yep. I was very interested when you were saying about 2.1 bars. Um, now, in my back, backyard is a, a large tangle and if I yep. pull it over the far side and face it to the northeast, um, then it's open backyard. So yeah. I was thinking... I was going to put it over the far right, so I was looking at my back door, and that means it will get the sun during the day and then shade yeah. in the afternoon, but that means it wouldn't have a fence in front of it. Um, if I put it over on the far fence, that's my neighbour's fence. So I was just sort of trying to work out how I would manage the above the 2.1. If I put the, a fence in front of it, it wouldn't get the sun so much. Yeah. Um, uh, are you in a sub in, in the suburbs? I mean, how big's the block? Uh, it's uh, a quarter acre block. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, again, wherever you put it, if it's near a fence, it needs to be the fence needs to be greater than two point one meters. So wherever you put it. Yeah, but if you put the what I was trying to work out. In front of it, and you're facing it northeast. You're going to block the sun. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, you perhaps need to re re reposition it so that the fence is in front of it on the northeast side, and have the hive in front of that. Perhaps. Have you got any trees that may cast the shade over the? Yeah, I could, the, uh, I could do that. Yeah. So, so try and try and think about the late afternoon sun. Look where that's casting the shade. You know, when the sun's higher in the sky, it won't matter in the winter months, but in the summer months it will. Sun's more direct, more overhead. So oh, try and okay. anticipate. Yeah. Try and anticipate yeah. where that shade's going to be, and then maybe position your hive there. And because you really don't have an entrance, um, it, it's not going to make a great deal of difference. Having said that, where you walk toward it, I would make sure you had some sort of barrier oh, yeah. so that they're not coming and going straight at you. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. I hope that helps. Sorry? I hope that helps. Yeah, no, thank you. And the other thing is in, in Castle, Maine, it is so hot in the summer. Yeah. Um, like super, super hot. And that's the other thing that I was worried about. So yeah, you, you won't need to worry. Look, there, there are plenty of beekeepers in Castle Main, I can assure you, and much oh, no, other regions. Mac McDonald's is not far down the road from yeah. us, but yeah. yeah, I just thought for myself. Yeah. That's um, that's why I'm saying to you that you want to really make sure that you've got, if you possibly can, cast some shade over that that hive okay. in the up in the hot afternoon, and just bear in mind that you know at the moment we're still on the way of, of the sun climbing to its highest uh, point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it'll be more direct over the top. Won't yeah. matter when it's sort of low in the sky, you know, um, in, in the cold, cooler months, that's not what we're talking about. It's yeah. more the, the hot part of the day. Yeah. So, that's yeah, you can fun. get them some shade from about 2 o'clock onwards. That's good Good stuff. Right. Thank you. Thank no you worries. Much. All the best. Okay. okay. Good luck. Well, Craig, we've I got some, We've got some dedicated bee beekeepers already online tonight, so <laughs> no, that's all right. So. Yeah. Um, Central Victoria is such a great place for bees I think yeah. we've, we've got a lot of options for them but um, mm. I think we we might leave it there because we're after seven o'clock but thank you so much for sharing such a wonderful talk with us and I hope everyone who's come along has enjoyed it I'm sure they have um, we have recorded the talk it'll take a little while for us to edit it um, but we will have it available online on the Goldfields Libraries 
YouTube channel um, and you'll be able to access, access that through our website. So keep that on in mind if you want to have another look. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and thanks in particular to you, Craig. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks very much for having me, and I'll uh, hopefully see you on the next one. All the best, and bye for now. See you. See, see you. Everyone.